I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, Miles, this isn't part of the book, but I do think it, it, it was what I came out of reading reading this book, Chasing Shadows, your book, Chasing Shadows, I came out of it going, that explains to me one of the sort of big questions was why were the DEA so interested in the European super cartel, as we call them? Why were they either at or undercover or had under surveillance Daniel Kinahan's wedding in the Burj Al Arab? And I think this book is, you know, the basis of why they're interested in these cocaine cartels and what they're doing and where their money is going. Um, so we're going to get through this as kind of simplistically as we can. It's a complex book. It's a complex story. And it it, it jumps across the world, of course, and to various different characters. Um, but we start somewhere. And in a way, we start at that wedding and then we have to go back, don't we? To, to where it yes. began. Um, and I, that is the bombing of the US Embassy in Beirut in 1983. Yes, I mean, it seems like a very, very long time ago. And it seems like a place which, uh, you know, hard to see a connection between the two events. But, um, you know, what we saw in 1983 was obviously the sort of real announcement to the world in a way, um, in a kind of very bloody and awful and spectacular fashion. This sort of new phenomenon in um, in, in Lebanon, obviously, this this Shiite um, political movement, you know, terrorist movement, which coalesced into Hezbollah, and that seems a very very long way away from a you know luxury hotel in Dubai, um, many many years later. But it really sort of underpins that there's a geopolitical element to this phenomenon, you know, the stuff which you've reported on so much, the sort of the European super cartel and European cocaine trafficking that it sort of transcended national boundaries as we know, but it also has taken on this important sort of place in the geopolitics of the world we live in. And interestingly, I suppose, if we bring ourselves back to 1983, not only just for the bombing of the US embassy in Beirut, but also where was cocaine then? Well, of course, the Colombians were eyeing up Europe, weren't they? And they were seeing it as uh, a market that they would be interested in. They saw it as somewhere that was less policed than the US and where they didn't have to go into competition with the Mexicans. Yes. And, you know, that's sort of the the one of the key parts of this book, the key stories is sort of the, um, let's say, a sort of a pivot by US law enforcement, specifically the DEA, more towards Europe. Because obviously, historically, we all think of the DEA, you know, looking at kind of big cartels in Latin America, the famous figures, you know, the sort of Escobars and the Chapo Guzmans and these types of people, you know, stuff in narcos. But, you know, over the last sort of 20 years, and especially after around 2010, you had this very big pivot by the DEA to start paying attention to what was happening in Europe, because Europe, obviously, as you know, emerged as this massively important market for international cocaine trafficking. And the DEA has this huge network of international offices, and it has its informants in every country, and it has this sort of massive web of intelligence. And so it starts to pick up on stuff. So, you know, around sort of 2007, 2008, around that sort of time, you know, it starts to, it has a really deep network in Colombia, and it starts to hear conversations, you know, it has these capabilities to sort of obviously do wiretaps, like, you know, uh, many other law enforcement agencies, but it starts to pick up stuff. Um, and it starts to see that a lot of the arrows are starting to point towards Europe. Yeah. Now, the significance of the bombing, of course, in Beirut is that there's two cousins who are picked up and they are jailed in relation to it. Um, but one of them, am I right, was freed when Baghdad was invaded by Saddam Hussein and he opened up the prisons. Yeah, so yeah, well, it's it Kuwait. Like um, Saddam yeah. Hussein in, in 1990 Kuwait, invaded yeah. Kuwait, and um, which sort of was this pretty surprising event. And then um, this this cousin, he's the lesser known cousin, but his mm. name is Mustafa Badr al -Din. He uh, was uh, the cousin of Imad Mugnir, who's sort of before bin Laden, I guess, was the most wanted and maybe famous terrorist in the world to some extent. And um, But his cousin Mustafa 
was uh, the lesser known cousin, let's say, and he was freed in 1990. And then our story sort of flashes forward um, from then to 2016, you know, mm-hmm. 2015, 2016, because Mustafa, this guy who has pulled off this series of spectacular terrorist attacks over several decades, you know, he assassinated, was eventually convicted after his death. Um, he was convicted for assassinating the um, prime minister of Lebanon. And back if we go to 2016, you know, closer to sort of our, this time now, you know, he is in Syria and he is fighting in Syria in the civil war. Mm. And the DEA at the same time is starting to investigate these networks of money launderers and sort of people connected into the kind of international criminal underworld who aren't necessarily moving cocaine, but they are sort of providing services to people who move cocaine. So, you know, if you're a massive European drugs trafficker, you have logistical needs, you know, you need to somehow move money around the world, or you need to pay your suppliers in Latin America. And the DA got really deep into this network of money launderers in Europe who were using Middle Eastern banks, principally in Lebanon, to launder vast amounts of money for European cocaine cartels. So these two cousins, and we'll call them Mustafa and Imad, just to make things simple, Mm. because... um, the second names is just confuses matters slightly, but they basically um, are right up the top of Hezbollah. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Imad Mugnir is the, the he leader. is the sort of the leader. Uh, most celebrated martyr, so to speak, in the um, history of Hezbollah. And, um, you know, it's there are, you know, vast numbers of memorials to him and stuff. And um, Mustafa, when he died, uh, sort of joined that pantheon. Uh, so they're sort of these iconic figures in, in the movement. But Mustafa had a slightly strange uh background and you know in his later life you know because he was um he was eventually found you know he was put on trial for this assassination of the prime minister of lebanon and they did a lot of uh digging into how he pulled this off and he was living a double life he was living undercover as a sort of flamboyant playboy with multiple girlfriends you know he was mm-hmm. a uh, on the face of it, a jewelry shop owner who had a yacht and you know spent a lot of his time out late at night, whilst at the same time planning this extremely intricate political assassination. So um, these they were characters always characters. have these two lives, and indeed they were complex characters. But I suppose as they're coming of age as terrorists, a number of interesting things happen. One is that there's sanctions on Tehran, which means that they cannot fund Hezbollah in the way they once were, could. In 2001, we have the 9-11 attacks, which sort of turns the attentions of the US so heavily onto that part of the world. You've got the Israeli-Hezbollah war in 2007, 2005, is it? Yeah, so 2000, yes, thereabouts. Okay, and by 2008, Imad, one of the two cousins, he is mega big, wanted in more than 40 countries. He is... Uh, you know, at the very top of uh, his game in Hezbollah. He's wanted by the DEA. He's wanted by Mossad. um, And he has this life in Damascus, this secret of life in Damascus. He's an incredible character in a way, and no doubt people have. You could write a whole series of books on him and his life alone. But um, he's killed in a car bomb, yeah? Yeah, he is a, he is assassinated in a car bomb, which uh, no one has ever claimed responsibility for, but is widely attributed to the United States and Israel as a sort of joint operation. Uh, this is where, real homeland stuff there now. Yes, yeah. very much. I mean, yeah, there's some been some brilliant uh, reporting and journalism about the real details of that operation, where the sort of the spotters on the ground in Damascus, which is an extremely hostile environment, to operate in as one can imagine sort of have to get the highest level of sign off, you know, presidential level sign off to pull the trigger, so to speak. And they have to keep waiting because he's not alone next to his car. And yeah, his real homeland stuff. Now, uh, Hezbollah itself is an organization. Why is it such a threat to the US, to the world? Who is it linked with apart from Iran, Russia? And what is its kind of like reason to be? Well, I mean, Hezbollah is a complex organization which has changed a lot over its history. And, um, you know, uh, you know, ostensibly its main mission is to uh, fight Israel. You know, that's what its sort of um, founding principles were uh, to a certain extent. I mean, obviously, it's intertwined with like Shiite um, Islamic theology. And 
but it's uh, that was its mission statement. And uh, there has been a lot of mission drift over the years. So uh, it's become, you know, more of a political party, you know, sort of running in elections. And it, that's also made things more complicated. You've had different approaches to it from around the world. So the US has always designated it as a terrorist organization. But several European Union countries some of them have changed this recently, they would split it into two. So they would say the terrorist wing of Hezbollah is a terrorist organization, but the political wing isn't. Um, but you know, over time, it has changed. And the big, one of the biggest shifts was its entry into the Syrian civil war. So I'm sure some of your listeners will remember that conflict as they got a lot of attention, obviously, because of ISIS and, um, and you know, just being a horrific um, conflict with huge humanitarian costs. But Hezbollah um, entered into the war to support Assad, to stop the Assad dictatorship from falling and um, with the backing of Iran and later Russia. And that was a big shift in its mission, you know, in the sense of like it was that's now it's fighting against, you know, fellow Arabs, you know, to prop up a hated dictator. And that was a very expensive war. And it caused a sort of ripple effect in the global criminal economy because you had a lot of things happening. You know, war is this big accelerant of crime in a way. You know, it creates all of these sort of illicit networks and stuff. And that that's a sort of background setting for this book. And of course, the surviving cousin, Mustafa, is in Syria at this point and almost becomes the right hand man. Is that right? Of Assad. Yeah, he's he's dispatched as a sort of the leader of the Hezbollah fighters who are sent to Syria. Um, what's it's just kind of absolutely fascinating that um, you know that there, there's this DEA investigation going on in Europe, you know, which links into Latin American cartels, which connects to him. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not sort of um, you know, there's there's sort of a, a very high level connection between the stuff. So it's um, uh, that's fascinating that he and he plays this obviously this big strategic role in the, in the conflict, but. As as people will see, it, it doesn't necessarily work out particularly well for him. Indeed. But we can place him in, in Syria in around 2011. And uh, at that point, and this is where we kind of like, you know, there's a constant thread through your book, through the story, which could read like fiction, by the way, Miles. It, you know what I mean? Sometimes you have to blink and remind yourself that this is true. But the thread through your book is the DEA and, of course, a character um. Uh, you have obviously had uh, a good relationship with and, uh, you know, who features very heavily in it, called Jack Kelly. He's a DEA counter-narco-terrorism operations uh, officer. And he sounds like we get a good look into, a good insight into his character. He's not in it for the fame. He's a kind of good guy that's there because he believes in right and wrong. And he sees the the, the kind of connections between the drug gangs, the Colombians and Hezbollah, this terrorist organisation so desperately in need of funding and despite its claims to be presumably anti-drugs like most of these terrorist organisations claim to be, uh, he can see that they are actually all working hand in glove and every shipment of cocaine that travels across the globe to come into Europe, to come onto the dinner uh, tables and the toilet cisterns in clubs across Europe where there's a huge demand for this stuff, that that is funding Hezbollah and exactly what is threatening the security of the US. Yeah, so it's a really interesting story with Jack Kelly. I mean, Jack Kelly is this, um, you know, he's a brilliant investigator, but he is someone who starts off on the streets of New York as a young, you know, sort of DEA cub agent in his 20s. And he does the things you'd expect a DEA agent on the streets of New York to do. You know, he's sort of, busting local drugs traffickers and you know sort of doing raids and these things and then at a certain point uh you know around sort of uh 2005 6 that sort of time he is um drafted into this division called the special operations division which is a part of the dea which was set up actually as far back as 1994 but it was sort of a almost a clearing house for information so they have all of these you know, sort of agents around the world and they have these, you know, different operations going into different criminal networks and they send this stuff back into this sort of central clearinghouse. And then they, the people there like Jack use that to sort of inform other people and create leads. And so he started to spot a lot of really interesting things. And it all sort of really started in Colombia, you know, with the big Colombian cartels. And 
they were sort of picking up in wiretap evidence, you know, people speaking in Arabic and people talking about how they could move money, you know, through the Middle East. And they started to follow those trails. And then at the same time, they were picking up on calls coming in from Europe or people stationed in Europe who were calling up money launderers in places like Medellin and saying like, okay, I can move this. I can pick up the money in, say, Antwerp tomorrow or whatever. And so it became quite clear quite quickly that there was this sort of triangle. There was this connection between all three of these seemingly very distant places. Mm -hmm. But people didn't really buy into that interpretation at the start. Why not? I think there was a, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people were pretty skeptical. So I think it's now, you know, in 2023, a bit more of a consensus idea. But, you know, back, you know, in say 2011, there were people in other US agencies, there were people in, you know, other walks of life who just didn't be- didn't really believe that that would be possible. Mm. It just seemed very unlikely. And obviously there's a sort of, counter terrorism or intelligence mentality where sometimes they can view these organizations the terrorist organizations as very very centralized and disciplined and ideologically driven organizations they're like well they wouldn't do that Mm -hmm. because that doesn't fit with their ideology but obviously in reality these are complex organizations where like any organization there were going to be people who are running little side hustles or doing their own thing or doing things which are contrary to the official ideology of the organization, but to some extent in the aim, the greater goals of the organization is how they justify it. And so it took time and in fact, never really happened until he retired that people started to really believe him. I mean, he had colleagues who he was working with who were very much, you know, the rest of the DEA were very much behind it, but there were other agencies who were just saying this is impossible. And of course, no, no matter how ideological any of these organizations are, um, And it was the same with the IRA. They are money machines and they need a huge amount of money to operate and to continue being or running at such a level of threat to societies. And uh, weapons cost a lot of money. Uh, You know, feeding an army costs a lot of money, doesn't it? So where are they going to get the money from? And I suppose, uh, you know, the problems within Iran, maybe... You know, what created it? It's a bit like the chicken and the egg, isn't it? All these sort of geopolitical things are happening that are, um, you know, are forcing these groupings almost together. So cocaine demand is rising. The Colombians are producing more. They're dumping it into Europe, which is creating mountains of cash money that they need to transport and they need to move. Uh, And sometimes, of course, they need the drug routes through these territories like Syria, don't they, as well? So they're they're Absolutely. working hand in glove. It's maybe obvious to us now, but it's it's uh, you know, in hindsight, Jack Kelly was had an incredible uh, vision of uh, of being able to join the dots there. Completely. I mean, it's it's sort of it's this kind of butterfly effect of this sort of like chaotic criminal capitalism, where like you you have these, as you say, these sort of like unexpected consequences of events, which then create other sort of things. And, you know, at a sort of really base level, like if you sanction a regime or if you're part of a terrorist organization, you know, as you say, you need to buy things. You need to go out and procure things you need. And you can't go on Amazon or eBay to buy that stuff. So you, you're you sort of forced, in, you know, instantly you have to start dealing with underworld procurement networks and people who can get you things. And, inevitably these worlds cross so you know it doesn't necessarily mean that the people who are in europe who are laundering money for you know which eventually benefits in some way you know people who are sort of moving arms into syria which are being used by hezbollah fighters or whatever it would be it, it, they may not be ideologically motivated at all they might be entirely pragmatic you know they're just sort of this is a business opportunity mm-hmm. and i can make a lot of money out of this you know there'll be it could be you know there there are these fantastic dea cases where you know, high, people connected to very high-ranking officials and uh, officials in Iran are sort of sent out into the world and asked to procure helicopter parts because Iran's under sanctions and they can't buy helicopter parts. So they need to kind of find a funny way to do it. And they end up sitting down with informants, you know, from the DEA who are posing as Venezuelan drug traffickers who say, of course, we can get you these helicopter parts. And it's just this strange meeting of unlikely characters in this shadow dimension, mm. which we can't normally see. Mm. Now, the the we'll follow Mustafa and his 
ultimate uh, death. But it's the links with him and then the Italians come on in on the scene that really kind of shows uh, Jack Kelly. And we'll claim him as Irish, by the way, because his name is good enough and he's <laughs> such a hero. Um, we like to claim... He is, he is, he is of Irish descent. I knew it, yeah, I knew yeah. it. All the good guys are. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the kind of, the, the, the pieces of the jigsaw come together for him and sort of explain to me in as, in as much as you can h- how that happens. So there's a number of things going on. I mean, you know, the in the Italians in the story are just like one of probably a very large number of end consumers for money laundering services in Europe. You know, they are basically buying, um, lot, they're attempting to buy a large shipment of uh, cocaine from a Colombian cartel, big cartel, you know, the Clan del Golfo, which is uh, one of the biggest. And um, they need to pay for it. And so they need to sort of interact with these money launderers who are part of the network that Jack is looking at. But uh, he, you know, he he pursues a number of cases. He has this big sort of list of targets and they go after them. They, they arrest one guy in Prague in this big sting operation where, you know, they have these undercovers who are sort of pretending that they want to buy, that they're, they're acting, they pretend that they're from FARC, you know, the mm-hmm. Colombian paramilitary group, and they're trying to buy rocket launchers. And then, you know, they swoop in and arrest this guy. Uh, but then he is not, he's now in, in the Czech Republic and it's quite complicated to get him extradited to the United States. So these operations don't always go smoothly, but then he, Jack, starts to pick apart this sort of network by following sort of the evidence and following the money and looking at people you know he, there's an informant in latin america who's plugged into the cartels and how they're laundering their money and they're calling up guys who are based out of europe who are then reporting into people who are based out of beirut mm-hmm. so they get a call and they say you know they speak in code they speak about cars you know they say you know we've got a mercedes 250 in naples we need to go pick it up or whatever and then they drive down to naples and pick up the cash you know which is basically being used to pay the colombian drug traffickers and then they start they launder it back to colombia through middle eastern banks and other means so and they're picking up stuff everywhere it's like they you know they have all of the phone metadata and all of the um you know information showing them going into spain you know obviously a huge amount of activity in northern europe you know in in holland in belgium you know these sort of big um hot spots for 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 drugs trafficking and money laundering and so bit by bit they start to piece together this network and see who is the sort of command and control mm-hmm. and you know they're based in beirut and they're connected to very very senior people in hezbollah what sort of money do you think has gone through that terrorist organization like they're laundering the money right so they're, 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 they're that's a very important process uh the money launderers rather they're, they're getting a percentage of the actual value of the cocaine what sort of percentage are they getting do you know any idea i've i've seen you know sort of you know it can be high i mean um it can be sort of 20 percent, depending on how difficult what i found very interesting about this when you look into the specific cases is that certain markets are considered more difficult than others by the money launderers so in a lot of the intercepts they're like we don't like working in france you know france is a difficult market you know so we charge more you know nice. maybe we charge 20 percent because you know the french police are actually quite proactive and you know this this um cell was eventually actually arrested in paris you know uh-huh. a lot they waited till one of the main people in the cells flew into paris and they did it sort of once or twice a year and they got them then but you know germany they like working in germany you know germany is a very cash sort of friendly market and so the rates very much depend on where you're working and how aggressive the law enforcement is. And you say about the Germans being cash friendly. Yeah, I was only reading recently about how there was a lot of uh, Dutch criminals carrying out ram raids on ATM machines in Germany because they love their cash and they don't love it anymore in the Netherlands. They've gone very much, you know, digital with money. Uh, So to get their hands on cash, they have to go in and blow the ATMs out of the wall in Germany. They've been doing it here on the border for years, but uh, um, you know, it's interesting to see those diff- those cultural differences in Europe. Of course, we're supposed to be one Europe, but there are major cultural differences between the countries and we're only discussing that now. That sort of stuff is news to me and more than likely to most of the listeners here, but the criminals know. They know all that sort of stuff. They are 
really essentially constantly a step ahead. We're always learning from them, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, you know, criminals have this sort of ingenuity where, you know, they 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 definitely um, clearly, you know, just even things like extradition, you know, throughout the entire history of sort of Euro- European organized crime, you know, people have been pretty quick to pick up on the right places to base yourself, you know, and the wrong places to base yourself. And um, I think um, it, it is a clearly like a very innovative um you know, innovative sector, so to speak, in the sense that people figure out ways to to do things which are new, and then eventually law enforcement catches up with them. And I mean, yeah. obviously, we've seen this uh, with you know encrypted communications, and you know, and it's a sort of cat and mouse game. And I think the money laundering techniques are definitely part of that. But it's just it's a side of um, organized crime which doesn't always get that much attention because you know it's quite it's quite geeky, it's quite technical. It's sort of um, mm. there's elements of it which are a bit confusing, you know, especially when we get to sort of use of hawala and sort of types of um, trustless sort of like a banking where well, it's not trust, it's sort of based on trust actually. Sorry, it's a trust based banking kind of system where you you transfer money without actually moving the money in effect. And there's all of these elements which um, uh, are really important in the sort of back end, you know, the sort of almost logistical side of running a criminal cartel or cocaine cartel but they don't always get so much attention compared to other things yeah because they are complex you have to really apply yourself to understand it i mean obviously the production of the drug is the number one uh sort of area of it the second is the transport routes which are hugely important There's no point in producing if you can't get it in but the money laundering because without that nothing happens it's all about the money as the criminals will tell you um Chasing Shadows tells an incredible story and weaves the various elements together in an almost like Tarantino fashion. Um, there's great characters in it. They're all true. They're you know this is this this is a, a a a this is not a work of fiction. This is an incredible story with the Irishman Jack Kelly at the centre of it. Um, but I suppose in a more general sense, and we started with the wedding of. Uh, Daniel Kinahan in the Burj Al Arab, um, the coming together of that European super cartel. And let's talk about money laundering with them because, I mean, you're talking billions. Like, how the hell do you launder that kind of money, that kind of cash? I mean, they have cryptocurrency, obviously, but in general, let's break this down. They're shipping cocaine across the world into Europe, most of it coming through the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam. It's split up and it goes onwards to its destination. But eventually when it gets to its sales point, cash changes hand. Mostly. I know some of them are using Revolut and all this sort of stuff now, but mainly it's cash, isn't it? Still. So where does that start to go? And and, and how do they end up bringing it all the way back to Dubai? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it can get very, very complicated in the schemes people use. I mean, people use what's called trade-based money laundering schemes, you know, where you sort of, you set up a company in one country and set up a company in another country and they buy and sell something. You know, it could yeah. be charcoal. You know, one of these DEA cases, you know, one of the big money launderers was offering to send charcoal from a Middle Eastern country to Paraguay, you know, and that was a way in which they could, um, you know, then you sort of falsify what you're actually sending, but then you can have a transfer of legitimate funds from Paraguay to, say, a company in Dubai, and suddenly you've got money in a in a bank, you know, and it looks kind of legit. And you know, it's, and it's it's hard to do that at scale. But then the scale of this stuff is actually, you know, quite mind mind boggling. I mean, you know, one of the networks, you know, which they, and these are, this was a not a, not the biggest by any means. You know, law enforcement officials I've spoken to were like, this was an important network, but it, this isn't the biggest network in Europe. This is one, mm. and um, you know, it was moving hundreds of millions, you know, a quarter. You know, it was just moving serious amounts of cash to locations all around the world. And one of the fascinating things the DEA does is they, you know, do these sort of follow the money exercises where they will send an undercover to, uh, to meet with a money launderer, say in Paris, and they will basically track that money, how it moves. You know, they'll basically say, I want this money sent to Australia, 
please, could you do this for me? How much will that cost? And they'll say, okay, we'll do it for you for 15% or something like that. And then they then set up a fake, you know, account in Australia, which obviously the launderers don't know is controlled by law enforcement. And then they can see the way the money moves through the financial system. Mm -hmm. And so then it often goes in these very convoluted ways, but you can move significant amounts that way. Um, You know, it clearly doesn't, it, it clearly works in the sense of all of you know law enforcement tries its best and does as much as it can but and learns and learns from the experts i suppose you know law enforcement yeah. is only learning but in the case of the huala the money doesn't actually move yeah i mean that's a, you know that's a really interesting thing you know you could have like a warehouse of cash in like you know antwerp you could have you know a vast amount you know really like you know hundreds of millions tens of millions at least and it almost sort of sits there and obviously moving that logistically is hard because let's say you did have, you know, 100 million euros in cash. It takes up space. You know, it depends on the denom- denominations of notes and everything, but it's pretty tricky to physically move that from one place to another. So Can you, you imagine that went on fire, Miles? <laughs> yeah, some people would be pretty upset, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a risk, you know, and it's also just sitting there. It's your sort of all of, you know, this vast amount of working capital for your drugs trafficking business. And it's just sat very vulnerably in this warehouse. And presumably you have to be extremely paranoid that someone might be a bit tempted if there's, you know, that much money sitting in your bit. warehouse to come after it. <laughs> Uh, just a little, but um, but you know, you have to have a system where you can move the value of that money without actually physically moving the money. So if another person in the location you want to send the money to, let's say it was you know in somewhere in Colombia, it was Medellin or something or Bogota, you you know that's, they would have a their own warehouse with a vast amount of money, and you would effectively sort of set a credit off against each one. So it'd be like. I, you know, my client will take, you know, 10 million um, dollars out of your warehouse. And then now you owe me that. Mm -hmm. And then a corresponding, the, you know, a reverse trade, someone on the other side will want to move money the other way. And then it will kind of net that off. Yes. So the actual physical money never really needs. Never really moves. And presumably the money is more than likely in bank accounts, in fake companies, in gold, in jewelry, in art. Is it? Or is it actually in cash, do you think? There's there's been some really interesting cases, you know, of art, you know, um, sort of people who are relatively important in the art world um, being accused of um, uh, by the US government, Department of Justice of uh, laundering money for Hezbollah, for example. Uh, But there's um, there's a lot of uh, different ways. You know, sometimes, you know, I've I've spoken to US officials who've told me cases of just, you know, pallets of cash being sort of put on, you know, you know planes i mean you know crazy stories you know back from a bit a bit longer ago maybe sort of like 15 20 years ago people actually just buying old planes Mm. you know like really really busted up sort of boeings which they then just fill with drugs or cash and just drive into like fly into a desert in west africa and then just take everything out and set the plane on fire and just walk away i mean you know there are sort of extreme um instances of that but it's sort of definitely it's it's just that it's a critical element to these yeah. organizations and is that and kind of are those kind of stories going to be quaint are they going to become something that we'll reminisce on and surely by the very nature of having to move the amounts of cash they're talking about now because it's going up all the time uh crypto is the way to do that so i think that's a really interesting point and something which i'm, I'm sort of um been thinking about a lot and i think uh one of the things i definitely learned in the reporting of this book uh especially on the italian side is that obviously these 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 criminal groups especially you know the sort of super cartel um characters have been enabled by technology in the sense of like 30 years ago you couldn't have sat in a villa in dubai and run a sort of international criminal empire because you know you didn't have things like encrypted messaging and all of these things so it's they've been enabled by technology and they're to a certain extent a sort of product of that technology and the sort of globalized age we live in. But kind of paradoxically, that also makes them vulnerable. You know, so eventually, as we've seen with these big sort of um, encrypted uh, messaging platform takedowns, you know, in the end, it can prove their undoing because suddenly like all the evidence is there, you know, suddenly it's just like, all written down and um, they can be tracked through technology. You know, there's a very invasive, you know, law enforcement techniques, you know, especially in Italy, you know, like anti-mafia police who I spoke to a lot, you know, they do amazing work and they really, you know, they have a lot of capabilities, you know, to sort of um, use technology against people. So the people who don't get caught or it's harder to prosecute them are sort of doing pretty old school things. Mm. You know, they're writing down 
pieces on pieces of paper they're um you know they're they're going up to someone on a park bench and nodding and winking at them you know they're 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 not vulnerable it's very sort of unglamorous uh and it you know but it does actually work yeah so it's this thing which has made crime organizations so powerful but it's also a huge vulnerability and i think with crypto sorry to your point i think that is the issue so it's like you know crypto allows you to do things but it also can be tracked and yes it can be and, taken. and do you trust it because you know, it's probably only a matter of time before it's easy. It's it's far eas- easier to seize it maybe in one fell swoop than, you know, if you have cash in various warehouses. And yeah, it's a nightmare. I reckon the richer you are, it must be such a nightmare. I reckon that uh, these drug organizations would, you know, realistically wish they'd er- earn less money. I actually do because I think the amount of headaches they have over how to spend the cash, you know, how to spread it around. I mean, obviously still an old fashioned way is through bricks and mortar. And that's probably still the mo- one of the most sensible ways really of, of you know, stashing cash, isn't it? I mean, despite the, yeah. <laughs> the ups and downs of the property market. Well, it's the classic side of sort of narco states, you know, in various places around the world, you start to see sort of skyscrapers popping up over time and, you know, people yeah. just sort of building stuff. And, um, you know, certainly what people started to see in uh, West Africa, some West African countries when that was a uh, kind of big spot for um, cocaine shipments and stuff like that. But it's, um, yeah, it's it's a problem. And, um, but it's like sort of this, uh, it's a really interesting sub element to this sort of boom in European organized crime where you have these sort of service providers mm. you know you have people who have to solve that problem uh they have to and, and they come up you know with ingenious um, ways of doing it but it also ties into this other sort of geopolitical element which is in the world we live in you know where there's sanctions you know there's sort of obviously massive sanctions against russia sanctions against iran north korea you have nation states with the capabilities of nation states who need access to hard currency they need to, you know, they are not allowed to interact with the US dollar system. Um, they have to kind of find ways to evade those sanctions. And so in the case of Russia, obviously, you see a lot of, you know, sort of procurement sales for Russian intelligence, working to get, you know, specific items, microchips, things like that. You know, but, um, you know, in the case of Iran, you know, you've had, seen a lot of the cases of, um, you know, people needing access to, to hard currency or figuring out ways to access things they're not allowed to by sanctions. And again, that is where you get this interaction between states, uh, you know, in sort of rogue states, so to speak, and the criminal underworld and people, for example, who might have 100 million euros in a warehouse in Antwerp. And while we have you here, me and the listeners on Crime World and your big Financial Times brain, right? And you're talking <laughs> about sanctions. Explain to me, what the US sanctions are likely doing to the likes of our friends, the Kinahans in Dubai at this particular moment in time, because they don't seem to be doing a huge amount of legitimate business. And do the underworld business partners they have recognize them? I mean, this is a, this is a really interesting point. And, um, you know, there is a question of sort of like, what do these sanctions actually do? I mean, obviously, on the on the on the face of it, they make life very, very difficult for you to do normal things. You know, it's not like you can, you know, b- pay for stuff with your contactless card or like, mm-hmm. you know, b- buy stuff off the Internet or, you know, have a mortgage. You know, you are toxic. You know, you are flagged. You're a massive KYC risk, you know, with a massive red arrow you know, over your name wherever you go in the world. And that makes life very difficult for you. But in terms of it's like practical difficulty, you see this with sanctions around the world. You know, there's a big debate over whether the sanctions actually work, uh, how well they work and what they're for. And clearly in the case of, um, you know, a criminal organization, they were already operating in the sort of shadow economy. They weren't just moving all of their profits through the legitimate banking system. And they don't have vast amounts of assets in their own name because that would be crazy. You know, they, they, would, they wouldn't do that. So they already know how to navigate around those sanctions. What it does do is it certainly smashes any attempt to sort of appear legitimate. It puts, you know, it makes you extremely hot. And I think for any counterparties, you know, associates, you know that if you're talking to someone who is sanctioned and, you know, really under the radar of US law enforcement, you are, it's a risk for you. It is. You know, you become sort of a bit radioactive and you're just too hot for anyone to want to go near. But at the same time, what it really does practically 
harder to say i mean it's a it's a it's a novel relatively novel thing to, mm-hmm. uh, you know we, to start doing it's a new thing, thing but funny anyway. you should say that about you know stuff in their own name because uh, obviously criminal criminals and criminal organizations don't you know they don't have kinahan.org or anything up but <laughs> in dubai they actually do have quite a few businesses and properties in their own name according to the US Treasury who detailed some of those things. So, right. So why do they feel they can do that in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates? And there's more than our, more than just the Irish out there. Um, you know, I speak constantly to colleagues in Italy, in the Netherlands and Belgium um, and across the world in Australia. And everybody, all the baddies seem to be there in Dubai, living it up. Uh, Dubai is or the Emirates, shall I say, is constantly trying to state politically that it won't put up with this. It isn't a money laundering hideout. Uh, it doesn't want drug dealers. And, you know, it's 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 laws would suggest that it's quite a, uh, you know, a prudish society, really, when it comes to these things. Um, but what's going on there that... It is a sanctuary or certainly from where I'm sitting, it looks like a sanctuary. I mean, that's an excellent question. And I think you must, uh, you know, when 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 any, both of us will speak to people in law enforcement or whatever, they will very frequently probably say, what on earth is going on with Dubai? Why are they allowing this to happen? And obviously we have seen, um, you know, I think in the most sim- simplistic sense, as, 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 as you'll know better than me, you know, it was um, a place where it was until recently almost unheard of to be extradited from. So that's a pretty big draw. But it is also at multiple levels, not just for, um, you know, sort of, let's say, you know, violent criminals or organized criminals, but all sort of types of different, uh, you know, white collar criminals. It is a money launderer's paradise. It has very low financial transparency. It's, uh, you know, there's very little surveillance of that sort of thing. And effectively, there's a sort of, you know, and I, I think, you know, you, you said it's a sort of very conservative society, but, you know, these people aren't, they're, they're, they're doing their business there. They're not, they're, they're not going to be, you know, being violent, committing mm-hmm. crimes, you know, they're not attracting the attention to themselves in that way um, whilst they're there. So, you know, it's a place where you can, you can turn up at the airport with cash. You know, you, there's been multiple, you know, little cases in the UK, you know, which get very little attention of people just, you know, getting caught at British airports with like a whole deal of cash, you know, mm. relatively small amounts, you know, 500k, a million or something just on their way to Dubai, because you can just turn up and drop it and deposit it in the bank account, no questions asked. So it has this massive draw, but it's not just organized criminals. I mean, you've seen since the invasion of Ukraine, you know, the 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 UAE is a is a place which um, is safe for Russian oligarchs. Mm. You know, so the, the the top famous Russian oligarchs, which all of your listeners will have heard of, you know, sort of the Abramoviches of this world, they spend time in Dubai too. Yeah, and um, it's a place where you can't enforce those sanctions, and so it raises these um these this question of you know what the effectiveness is, but it doesn't mean that the sanctions are are pointless. Mm. You know, but there is a question to say, you know are sanctions sometimes a sign of weakness? Because, you know, ultimately the ultimate sign of strength would be arresting someone and bringing them in. Yeah. Well, you know, we live in hope and uh, there's there's a, already a, a, a murder warrant anyway out for one of the ki- members of the Kinahan organisation who remains free since last April when that warrant was uh, publicised, Sean McGovern, and is regularly seen in pubs around Dubai um, the the you know the 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 father and the two sons who are there, there's no clear indication yet as regards where they're going, be it to Ireland, Spain, or the US. But they're wanted, or information at least around them is wanted. But I always think the Sean McGovern case is an absolute you know that's a real eye opener of what's happening in the United Arab Emirates. That uh, I regularly receive reports of where he is sitting eating a meal. And uh, yet the police in Dubai haven't been able to put their hand on him as of yet. Anyway, bit of a bugbear. I'll move on from that. Um, the book, I, I love the end of it, um, which doesn't ruin the story, I have to say. Um, and it's just this uh, beautiful scene of Jack and he's retired. And uh, it's sort of 
all comes full circle and really what he's discovered. And it's it's the intricacies of that discovery, as I say, and all the characters in this book that make it so interesting, so informative and educational. But he's, uh, you know, he's there at home and he's having his few pints down the road and he's lifting his weights and they eventually decide they're going to give him an award for all he, he knew about all those years ago and for, you know, his information coming good. He doesn't bother going to, to take it, but he sticks it up on the... Uh, the garage wall where he where he lifts his weights and he just sort of smiles at it every now and then, doesn't he? He's a cool yeah, I mean, he's a cool know, customer. He, he's you know he's he's someone who you know he really cares about the job. You know he was such a committed yeah agent. You know he spent you know he's the sort of guy who worked really really hard and you know spent all his sort of waking hours thinking about this stuff. You know he would work weekends. He would just you know he would never 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 say like oh I'm too busy or something. And so. I think, but he never really cared about, you know, being recognized officially. Yeah. You know, I think he, he cared about the cases. He cared about bringing in cases, building cases. And that's what really motivated him. Uh, so, you know, getting an award wasn't, it's not such a big deal for him. No, indeed. More like him when we'd be in a, a better place in the world. So, Miles Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on.